a basket of things. That's what we're going to talk about today, only it has a great deal to do with you in this generation. It was Father, as he looked out upon the world and some time ago, that he gave these prophecies and he likened the fig to many things. But when it came to the end time and how things would be, he gives us some really good advice. And he uses the analogy of the fig basically to whereby we could ascertain what he's speaking of, the purpose or the cause of shortcomings or overcomings, and the subject and what you should do about it. So we're going to begin with chapter 8 of the great book of Amos in the Minor Prophets, and we're going to read verse 1. And verse 1 reads, with a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. Now, do you know what summer fruit is? That's ripe fruit. That means it's ready for picking, or it's going to fall. It's plump, and it's ready. Verse 2. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? Take a look at it. And I said, a basket of summer fruit. I mean, it's really ripe. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. Meaning, the end time prophecies are there, and these figs incidentally are ripe for chastisement. Many of them are. For a reason especially at the end. And um, we'll skip with to the 11th verse, and there you have the why. You have the why in the 11th verse of the 8th chapter, and it reads, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor, nor, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. It irritates our Father when people do not pay attention to Him. He has written us a letter in many books with much advice that will always see you through. You might get a little mud splashed on you when you're crossing through, but you're going to make it through. This tells you how to do it. And as long as you listen to him and judge him by what he says and then do what he says, then you do not fall in the category of chastisement. And there was another time, and it's important that you know, especially when it has to do with the end, because you're living there. So turn with me to the great prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23. There we have the fig set forth, and there we have the cause. They're not listening to the Father. The famine is because no one is teaching the Word of God. And it's important that God's Word be taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. So we pick this up again. Who does basically the fault lie with? Well, if it's a famine for the Word, it's common sense that who's supposed to teach that Word? Well, the prophets, the priests, the pastors, they're supposed to be teaching the Word of God, but it would seem that in our generation, many would rather teach traditions of men. All they try to give it credentials by being a one-verse reverend and then going on for a considerable length of time on God said this or God said that. But the question for you is, did God really say it? And there's one way you can always do your homework and find out in this letter that he's written you. So let's pick it up, if we may, and see where the fault lies, whose door it rests at. And woe be to them, for God is not happy. 
Chapter 23, the great book of Jeremiah, verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Now, what's a pasture for? Use the analogy of sheep. What is, what is the pasture for? It's to feed. It's to take on substance. Take on something that will stick with you. As a matter of fact, the word pastor comes from pasture. And a shepherd, when he knows what the salmon consists of, not for bread, not for water in the end, but for hearing the word of God as God stated it, not as man would state it. Verse 2, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastor, pastors that feed my people, that are in charge, are supposed to be, ye have scattered my flock, and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Now, those of you that have, are connected with agriculture, or even if you have pets, think how much link you go to to, if you're away from home, who's feeding those pets? Who's taking care of my livestock? You know, because that's a great concern to a person that is in the agriculture business. Not only just because he makes a profit from them, but compassion for animals. A good man will fight over foul treatment of his livestock because an intelligent man shouldn't abuse a dumb animal. They're not all that dumb. But think about that. He said, they, they do. They, they scatter them because they won't get out and hustle and provide fit pasture for them. Won't find the pasture. And quite frankly, you as a student of God's Word that plants seeds, you should hustle. You should find information that alleviates hunger, especially those that have hunger pains. And my friends, there are many people in this world that have hunger pains and are searching searching for some solidity, a foundation that they can stand upon, that they can count on, then naturally that foundation is our Father through the Son, who is the rock of our salvation, who is our strength, and gives us that solidity whereby you can withstand any type of oppression or persecution. Good pasture. It's a good word. And it has every answer you will ever want if you take the trouble to scratch around. If you ever need a hint, go by someday when somebody didn't feed the old hens and they got a little batch of chickens and watch them scratch. They will really get to it. I, I'm sorry, I know I'm leaving a lot of you in the smoke because you haven't had the pleasure of growing up on a farm or around livestock. But an old mother hen, she will cluck and call those chick little chicks to her, and when it would appear nothing is there, she will dig and scratch, and when she finds it, she won't eat it herself, she'll push it to those chicks. Amazing sight to see. So it doesn't hurt you to do that a little bit when you see somebody hungry, if they're in a position whereby they will eat. Verse 3, and I will gather the remnant of my flock. He's going to do it. Out of all countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to the poles. And they shall be fruitful and increase. You know why? You know why he's going to gather them? Because he's going to feed them. He's already provided. He's going to give them a shepherd that will treat them right. That's what he's saying. For and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Lacking in what? Hunger, food, meaning God's truth. Verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign 
and prosper, I mean really prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. You have judgment and you have justice in God's word when you align your life with it. Being a can-do person, a stand-up. Now, if somebody wants to take the time to have a few whining hours every day, no, God just doesn't care about me. Well, go ahead, have a pity party. You know, it won't help you. If anything, it just sops energy. It's depressing. And do you know something? It's not only depressing to you. It's to do, it's depressing to people around you. What kind of shepherd are you? Oh, God is nice. Yeah. Don't don't do it. Something is wrong with you. But then you don't understand. Oh yes, I do. You're having a pity party. But they didn't do me right. But what'd you do to them? Well, I'm special. You know? God has me here for a special person. I don't purpose I don't have to do anything. I'm just a blessing for people to be around. See, I, I, maybe I go overboard on this, but you know the type. And, and it's such a pain to see someone hurt themselves that way when God says, I'm right here. I'm right here. I sent you the letter. Stand up and act like a man, woman, or child of God. And cut it. Because you're a can-do type person when you do it my way. So he's going to set that judge, and he's going to place that king. And there is justice, but let justice begin here with each of us as we analyze ourselves and try to follow the footprints that he has set forth for us through this king, which is Emmanuel, God with us. Six. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. And our Lord is his name. He is returning. And that's when the gathering will be. And in the millennium, talk about a feeding. But you don't have to wait till then. You don't have to wait till the gathering. Okay. To the 16th verse, uh, for the sake of time. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in this chapter because God gives you advice on how to choose a teacher, a pastor, as well as you that plant seeds and kind of teach the word yourself, what he expects. Verse 16, uh, cover the in-between, because if we were to have covered verse 12, you would find I will bring evil upon them even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And we're getting close to that year of visitation. Verse 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. Now, wait, let's get the qualification. That make you vain that speak a vision of their own heart, means their own mind. They dreamed it up. Had a dream. And not out of the mouth of the Lord. You mean God's mouth speaks to people? You bet. Both ways, but mostly right here. It was his mouth that brought forth the very words we're reading. And he left that information there for you to absorb. And when you have absorbed enough of it, of the truth and the maturity, then certainly at that time, perhaps he will begin to guide you further because he knows that he can use someone that is not hard-baked putty but that are pliable in his hand. Verse 17. They say still unto them that despise me. Again, the qualification is there. Who despises God? People that feel they've been hurt by and just pity party till they're past salvation. All right. The Lord has said, you shall have peace. 
And they say, everyone that walketh after the imagination of their own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Now, the analogy of this entire thing, so that you'll know where you are, goes back when God told Jeremiah, you're going into captivity 70 years in Babylon. The king of Babylon is coming. And what does that mean to you today? The king of Babylon, this was only a type, he is coming. You're going to uh, observe that. And God has given you plenty of food for thought to be prepared, whereby you know that that's no temptation to you whatsoever. It doesn't shake you up. God said, I didn't say there was going to be peace. Quite the contrary. I said, the king of Babylon is coming. Well, how does that apply to today? Well, they won't say, you don't have to worry, because you're going to be gone. You'll be away, 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 because you're spiritual. And a little lady in 1830 dreamed that we're gathering together in a big glob, and away we go. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking down to people, but I'm talking to an audience that knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's the same thing. The king of Babylon is coming. But he's no threat to us, because God has given us power over him. And as long as you are in the Word and in your Father, you have not one iota to fret about. Quite frankly, I know many of you look forward to it. Let's get it on. Bring him on. Of course, God's on time and everything. But this is an exact analogy or type that transpired in Jeremiah's day. And God says, I dislike those preachers that say that. I dislike those pastors that dream their own dreams, make up their own stories, and tell people contrary to what the Word of God actually says. To throw them off, to rob them, to starve them, to scatter them. And it is sad. It is very sad. And the starvation continues. If anything, it is worse and worse, and it gets worser, as they say in Alabama. Okay? For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord? Hey, it doesn't take you long to tell, my friend. And hath perceived and heard his word? Question. Who hath marked his word and heard it? That marked means meditated on it. Really marked it in your mind. It made a point. It made common sense. And you knew it was true. You can tell that, and you know a phony when you see one. Am I saying that they maliciously um, become phonies? No, I think probably in their own hearts they think they're... I mean, that's what the Brotherhood says to teach. That's what the Brotherhood believes. And if they taught anything otherwise in that system, they would be looking for a new place to rest their feet, right? Because they would be excommunicated. they got to go by the system. Let me tell you something. There's only one system, and you've got it right here. It's our Father. He's always right. Man will mislead you. Well, how, just tell me, how can I be certain that a teacher has been in the counsel of God, man, woman, or child? How can I tell, according to whether they can document what they're saying to you and teach you from God's Word, not their own? If they can't teach you God's Word and explain it, have it marked, then it shouldn't take a real bright person to say, hey, this dude doesn't know come sick of He doesn't know come here from sick of But you don't understand, brother. He's a reverend. 
Well, maybe somebody reverends him. I know Satan probably would really love him if he really misled the people. Now, I don't want to get the reverends all stirred up in a hornet's nest here. There are good ones. The ones I want you to be aware of are those that teach false doctrine, that hurt God's children. God doesn't like it. I don't think you do. Okay, mark God's word. It's not difficult for you. Nineteen. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. That's to say the lawless one. That's to say the spurious Messiah. That's to say the king of Babylon. And that's to say those that are deceived. God's not going to be that easy on them, especially pastors. I'm sorry, when you bite off that chunk, you carry a heavy load. And you're going to answer for it. Verse 20. The anger of the Lord shall not return. In other words, he's not going to get over it soon until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. That's to say, his total, complete plan that is set in his mind and is set in this word. It should be no big mystery to you. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. In other words, in the latter times today, you should have a pretty perfect understanding of it. Peace, 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 they cry. Friend, until the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Righteousness that we covered in verse 6, until he returns, we're going to have contention. And that's good. Because that's what you're a soldier for in our Father's service, is to witness the true Word of God and to stand with Him, to be a champion of your people, and not to be deceived lightly by whatever credential some individual might claim to have or be. It doesn't take you long to see through smoke. It always rises and clears a little bit, and then just look what you've got. But mainly, is it God's Word? That's the question. Is it God's true Father that's feet for His children? If it isn't, you better do some culling, and you better do it quick. Because God is angry. He's not going to put up with it. The wind of that whirlwind is already circulating, because it is the latter days. And uh, get ready for the storm. And if you're on the rock, it doesn't even touch you. It's just a big pleasure to see God's Word working and coming to pass. 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran, oh, they're anxious. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied, you don't have to worry. You don't have to understand God's Word, especially the book of Revelation. You don't have to understand that. You know why. I don't have to tell you, you're going to be gone. Boy, I cannot imagine someone allowing a man to tell them if they didn't have to understand our Father's Word. Boy, red flags would go up. I, it, I would be almost ready to fight, and that just be my nature to blast women. That uh, someone would tell someone they knew more than God. They're setting them up for Satan's camp. There's no other word for it. And that's what God's telling you. I didn't send them. They dream it all up. 22. But if they had stood in my counsel, if they would have listened and had caused my people to hear my words, not theirs, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. What is he saying? It is written. All you have to do is stick with it. You know, it is real sad that a system has developed in this nation that a group of people meet once a week, whatever day it might be, and they're like a lot of little birds in the spring, just after hatching time. Feed me. Yeah. Do it all for me. 
I don't have time to do it, preacher. You study it out. Well, let me tell them something. They're going to answer for it. Because God gave them a mind they can think for themselves, and they're not little birds. They're not to be spoon-fed. They're to be fed fodder that will carry them for a day's work doing God's work. All right? God's not happy, my friends, with the system that has allowed. Why? Well, if you can spoon-feed them long enough, your pablum pretty soon they're hooked on it. They've got to have it. They don't want any of the good stuff. They want that old synthetic stuff because it's so reassuring. You don't have to worry. You don't have to understand God's Word. Just listen to me and I will assure you, you're going to be gone. It's, it's sad, but it's all over this nation. It's all over the world. That's what God is talking about. His words would turn people away from deception. It's that simple. 23. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? He's always at hand. Do you have to take, do you have to listen to just some man? Or can you take God's word and communicate with him? He says, I'm right here with you. I'm not hiding somewhere. 24, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel, do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord? In other words, I'm, I'm in the earth, I'm in heaven, I'm everywhere. I am that I am. I am what I will be. And if you need him, he's there. You, your children, you always keep in touch. You know where they are, basically, as long as tragedy hasn't interceded in some form. Well, our Father does too, and He says, I'm here to help you. He even knows what you're thinking, so you certainly can't hide somewhere and hide a thought from Him. 25. I have heard what the prophet said. They prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. 26. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, their own illusions of mind. Boy, would I hate to be in their shoes. That's why we want to be real careful. Does God speak to us in dreams? Yes, He can. But you better know the difference between a sour pickle or a pizza dream and the real thing. All right. Better get that down pretty pat. How, well, how do I know? It'll be written. You'll know. 27. Which think to cause my people to forget my name, Yahweh, by their dreams which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal or forgotten my name for the king of Babylon or have forgotten Christ for spurious Christ. They don't know the difference. The prophet, 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream, and he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Chaff is what to the wheat? It's nothing. Wheat is hard. It is uh, stable. It will fall straight down where the chaff, the winnowing fan, blows it away. In other words, if you stick with this word, you won't have to apologize. It will carry its own weight. Well, there's a bunch of lies and, and fairy tales and dreams are gone. Here today, gone tomorrow. Never amounted to a hill of beans. 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Think what the fire does to chaff. I mean, chaff is just a fire. I mean, it's fuel going somewhere to happen. All right? Poof. When God returns, that's what's going to happen to a lot of so-called doctrines. Poof. Or if they think they've got a rock, wait till God, if it's the true rock, it'll be fine when God's hammer hits it. 
But if it's a fake rock, when God's hammer hits it, look out. I hope you're wearing goggles that day. Verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. They steal it. Now, now, see through that. It's not really his word. They hear the neighbors saying it and say, you hear what God said? They didn't get it from God's word. They got it from a neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith, I had a little talk with God today. And God told me this, or God told me that, and told me I should have vanilla ice cream today instead of strawberry. God told me that. Now, I'm overplaying that, sure, to make a point. If somebody isn't smart enough to know what kind of ice cream they like or where they're going to park their car, God can't use them anyway. All right? He doesn't deal with, with nonsense. We have this thing in our nation that has developed that if one man can make you think that God speak, God's got to consult with that old boy every morning. Yep. Before God can do a thing, he's got to go talk to him about his ice cream. It's one upmanship to say, yes, don't get too close to me. I walk with God. And it's, it's a preacher game, all right? And the people say, oh, Lord, God talks to those men of God every day. Well, if they're not talking to you what's in this book, do you know what? They're lying to you. God didn't say nothing to them. They're playing church. Little church next door, 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. So light. God deals with heavy stuff, friends, and don't ever forget it. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all. Zip, not a, saith the Lord. Well, it just feels so good to go there, though. Well, what did the, it just, you know, it just took me right up there and made me feel good about myself. But what did you learn about God's Word? Uh, well, well, uh, well, well uh, I don't know, but I feel good. If you didn't learn something about God's Word, you wasted your trip, friend. Get real. 33. And when this people, or the prophet, or a priest, shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? And you better learn this one real good, friend. If you want, if you want God to be angry at you, just don't absorb this. And just try it one time. Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? Question. I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. Do you know why? You know what a burden is? What's the bad news from God today? God doesn't have any bad news. It's all good news for us. And if you ever, once in your, you know, you'll fall right in the category with these things. Oh, God left me. That's bad news. It didn't come from God. He's telling you straight out, if you want to take me off, if you want to get on my bad side, just ask somebody what the bad news is from God today or what burden he's placed on us. It didn't come from God, my friend, and you, you better put that in your book and you better wear it right real snug and close to your heart and mind. Because everything works to the positive when it is in God's plan and way. It's good news. There may be some hardships. And let, let's, let's think of a real quick example. Two real young people make mistakes, and they, they uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they get married way too young in life, and they're not, didn't really understand what the situation, they just wanted to do what was right and everything, and they roll along, and in five years, they're just not compatible. I mean, if they don't do something, one of them's going to kill the other one. So they, they get smart and decide, we better split up. And, and sad as it is, the, and really sad, oh, I just like divorce, but it happens. And then they begin to accept the Lord and see the truth, and 
and have stability in their life and they meet someone else that maybe God himself sent. And a church that will not teach that Christ is able to forgive sin is putting burdens on you from God. Oh, God said, if you think I'm talking about giving people license to sin, forget it. I'm just saying when you finally mature and you come to that point that you truly repent, God wants you to be fulfilled and happy. So beware those that put shackles on Christians to belong to their organization. It's again one purely plain old one-upmanship. So beware of those that say this burden is placed upon you by God. It makes God angry because you do not have the concept and you cannot see the love of our Father under those conditions. His forgiveness and the price he paid for it makes a mockery of it. So beware. If you think I'm condoning divorce by that little spiel, you're mistaken. I dislike it. But it doesn't mean your life is over. It's not the unforgivable sin, and don't you ever let anybody put you in bondage because of it. If you have repented totally and fully and have had a change of heart, don't let... There is no bad news from God, and that's a very serious point, my friend. I mean, if you want God to begin to put stumbling stones in your way, just do it. Just say it. And really, that's what the pity party is doing, if you've got it. God really, really dislikes those that say, Why did God do this to me? And they did it to themselves, or allowed it to happen. Verse 34. As for the prophet, the one that said this, and the priest and the people that shall say, The burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. I mean, well, well I didn't know God would put it. He's going to take the goodness away from that house. The old man's responsible for it. Then the kids better wake up pretty soon. They haven't got too much for a pap, all right? Because he's not in God's blessings. 35. Thus shall you say everyone to his neighbor and everyone to his brother, What hath the Lord answered? Question. And what hath the Lord spoken? Question. It's real easy to say that. Do you know what? If they're really good, they're well unfounded in this word where they can tell you. Or you can look at, you can check it out for yourself, and you should. 36. And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more. In other words, there is no bad news from God. Don't you even think it. For every man's word shall be his burden. In other words, I'm going to hang it in reverse right on your neck. And you can count on it, friends. He'll do it. For you have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. I'm telling you, friends, you can count on that happening. And you can sure ease a lot of burden in your own life by recognizing God's word when you hear it. 37. Thus shall thou say to the prophet, What hath the Lord answered thee? Question. And what hath the Lord spoken? With respect, of course, question. 38. But since ye say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because ye say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, You shall not say the burden of the Lord. 39. Therefore... Behold, I, even I, that's God swearing by himself two times for emphasis, will utterly forget you, and I will, did he say maybe, I will forsake you in the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence, 40, and I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. And I'm going to tell you something. Those that have their pity parties and their pity party religions, quite frankly, that make God a slave master instead of a father of love, 
It'll happen to them. It will. Individually and even as a group. When did he say these things would happen? In the last days it shall come to pass. Chapter 24, verse 1. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smiths and from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. So here we go, all the way back again to the pig. But there's a very important thing. After talking about these false preachers, he's showing you two baskets. The choice is yours, my friend. That's what God is telling you. You better choose right. And you had better study with a group that teaches both baskets. One won't cut it. Because if you're not if you're ignorant of the other, it'll slip up like a serpent and bite you. You've got to know both. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. You know that this is the prime root of the parable of the fig tree that Jesus said, don't maybe get around to it. He said, learn it. And he intends that you should. Verse 3. Then said the Lord unto me, what seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs. The good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, they cannot, that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, 5. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah. Again, this has the same type for you in the end days that are carried away captive by the king, the spurious Messiah, the king of Babylon, the book of Revelation. You that stand against him are good figs. Why? Because you teach also about the bad, warn, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. In other words, God sent the king of Babylon to take them captive for their own good. I don't want to go, that's a different subject for a different time, actually, to understand, well, why is it good for them that the spurious Messiah, King of Babylon, comes? Because they will be assured at that time of every knee bowing on the first day of the millennium, and will pass on for the moment. Six. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them, and not pull them down, and I will plant them, and not pluck them up. That hasn't happened, friends, yet, to the fullness that he's speaking of here. Yes, it began in 1948, but the fullness hasn't even come close. Seven. And I will give them an heart to know me. That's a mind to know the truth. That's the goodness of him. That I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart, meaning their whole mind. But what do you want to watch out for? Eight, to conclude this lecture. Eight, and as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely, thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue. You underline that word, residue. That means Kenites and all others that are there that is the seepage or the bad worm in the basket of evil pigs. And you'd better know it. That remain in this land and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. And he continues on about delivering. Well, you are in that time. You're in the end times. Your father, who spoke, and nothing became everything, is very intelligent. We as human beings, as men, fall short. We don't know everything. But he at least gives you the knowledge to be able to research for yourself, whereby you can tell if someone 
is trying to deceive you, or if the Lord actually works through that particular group or party, and you you can you can sense it because He has given you the spirit of discernment. When you first take the step to seriously understand our Father's Word, He gives you that discernment. And when you hear it, then at first it may sound strange. Well, meditate on it. He said, mark it. Think on it. But you be the one that makes your mind up whether it should be rejected or accepted. How simple is it? Real simple. If it's from God, accept it. You'll find more than one proof in his word that it is. You'll find second, third, fourth witnesses. If it's not from God, reject it and be forewarned. The parable of the fig trees. Learn it, he said, and you should. Our Father is so precious. He's so good to us. And he knows our word. He knows whether your word is good, in which basket it belongs. And he's still working with us, educating us, and allowing us to grow as we may into that word whereby you'll be a blessing to those that come in contact with you. Because you'll be able to feed them something that really amounts to something, rather than a mouth of wax. Think about it. Father, we thank you for the written word. Thank you for that reminder we have that guides us. And in these times, Father, we thank you for being with us. We ask a blessing for our nation and the world, Father. And Father, that, that will be, let it be. And we, thy servants, will follow. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen.